Hostage, a Todd Mills mystery, book three in the series. Arthur R.D. Zimmerman, publisher, Scribble Pub. Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 34. He punched off the VCR and sat there staring at the blank screen. The headphones still clasped over his ears. Todd didn't know what to do. It couldn't be anywhere else. And if they were holding Clarendon at the Mega Ball, didn't Rollins have to be there too? Hell, where else could he be? Someone started banging on the door and the metal mini blinds banged and rattled. Todd! called someone twisting the door handle and trying to get in. Todd, open up! It was Frank, the assignment editor. Oh shit, Todd didn't care if Dan Rather was out there in person. He didn't want to do another interview. Not now, not today. There was too much else in his life that wasn't making sense. Todd, damn it all! He ripped off the earphones, rolled his chair over to the door, and twisted open the lock. Frank immediately burst into the room, followed by Craig. The producer, Todd, pushed himself back, rolling all the way to the VCR. Todd, we've got to get this straightened out with Rather's producer, began Frank, clearly perturbed. We can't just blow it off like this. I mean, you do know that this kind of exposure is good to do for your career, don't you? Sick of hearing that. Todd sat there, a flat expression on his face. Who cared about the friggin' networks? Gee, and I don't think you want to blow off the FBI either, said Craig, unable to hide his irritation. It just wouldn't be a good idea. Frank said, besides, we've got to stay ahead of Channel 7. You have heard about their morning broadcast, haven't you? Todd froze. What? They're running promos, saying they're going to do a special report from Cindy Wilson's hospital room at 10 this morning. That's in about a half an hour. They're claiming she's going to identify one of Clarendon's kidnappers and provide some big break in the case. Todd bowed his head into his right hand. Okay, he knew what was up. Sidney was going to give a description of Matthew, not only as of yesterday with his shaved head and shrunken face, but what he looked like in the picture with Kurt. The $64 trillion question was whether she would divulge just how she got this information. She might claim she garnered all this via her expert journalistic skills as they dragged her away with Clarendon, or she might claim that she'd gotten it from one person in particular, namely Todd Mills, who kindly stopped by last night with a nice color snapshot of said kidnapper. Ah, shit, thought Todd in the virtuous interest of her career. Cindy Wilson had screwed him over when Michael had been murdered, and she might very well do so again. She'd said as much last night, her big story might not be about Clarence and his abductors. No, depending on how peaked her trashy tabloid skills were, and how much she'd already revealed, her story might be about Channel 10's star reporter withholding critical information from the police and the FBI. He wouldn't put it past her. In fact, if she was half as conniving, half as good, half as smart as Todd thought, Cindy would do just that implicating Todd for no other reason than to get him yanked in for questioning. That, in turn, would not only offer Cindy Wilson and WTCN a searingly hot story, something juicy like star reporter part of gay conspiracy, but put Todd, her competition, out of commission for a few days. Dan Rather's people would drop Todd in a millisecond. Listen, began Todd, wondering just how the hell he was going to explain this, or even if he could. I went down to the hospital to see Cindy Wilson last night. Oh no, this isn't good, muttered Frank, shaking his hand. One hand to his forehead, Craig said. This sounds very mucky, am I right? Are you mucky with Cindy Wilson? You are, aren't you? Oh God, I just sense it. Perhaps. Uh-oh, moaned the producer. What is it, Todd? You know something, don't you? Perhaps. He checked his watch in a little over 30 minutes. He very well might be tumbling from star to traitor. I need to be real upfront with you. There's a bunch of stuff I need to explain. Why don't you bring the FBI guys down to the conference room? I'll meet you there in a couple of minutes. Okay, two minutes, said Craig. No more. Don't worry, I just want to get some stuff together to show you. Oh, God, I think I have a headache. And I think it's going to get a whole lot worse. It just might, Todd replied. Rising from his chair, he shooed them out and shut the door. Todd then returned to the VCR, took out the tape he'd made months ago at the Mega Mall, and went over to his standing file cabinet. He pulled out the second drawer, thumbed to an obscure file, and dropped in the tape. Okay, he thought as he slid shut the file drawer. No one was going to find that sucker, at least not for a good long while. 
Now what? He didn't have any choice, so how was he going to do this? Right. He touched his sport coat. Yes, his wallet was there in the inside breast pocket, and his keys were in the pocket of his pants. He then grabbed a coffee cup he'd used days ago that still had a bit of sludgy coffee at the bottom, swung open his office door, and headed into the newsroom. Just going to get some more coffee, called Tan over the tops of a couple of cubicles. Frank, pacing anxiously, anxiously behind, the elevated assignment desk glared at him. Just one thing, don't ruin my career too, okay? That's all I ask. Todd nodded, continued through the cubicles and crossed to the commissary area. The large industrial-sized coffee urns were to his left. Todd turned to the small sink on his right, rinsed his coffee mug, grabbed a paper towel, and slowly dried the cup. Glancing back into the newsroom, he saw that neither Frank nor the producer were coming this way. Todd then went to the coffee urn, pulled on the red handle, and half-filled his mug. He took a sip, glanced around. Two associate producers sat in their cubicles to his right. A secretary was typing something, but all of them were much too busy to take notice. Todd turned, made his way past a stack of daily newspapers, all of which he saw with a casual glance, featured the Clarendon story in massive headlines, and left the newsroom. Anyone would have thought Todd, rather than cutting through the chaotic newsroom, was going around the back way to the conference room. He stopped in the hall, swigged his coffee, and glanced up and down the corridor. No one, not a soul. Wasted on an instant, he spun and darted for the parking lot doors. There was no way in hell he was going to be able to explain Rollins, their relationship, AIDS, meeting one of Clarendon's abductors way back when. At least, not quickly, because... Of course, Todd didn't understand it himself, and there was no way in hell he had any time to waste answering questions for the FBI. No, the President of the United States and every law enforcement branch in the country might have one and only one priority, but Clarendon most definitely wasn't Todd's. He had only one, Rawlins. Dashing outside, Todd chucked his coffee mug and all into some juniper bushes and raced down the low steps across his lot and to the Channel 10 Ford Explorer he'd been loaned. He jumped in, brought the engine to a quick start, and slammed down on the gas. The tires screeched as he roared out of the lot. Turning right into the street, he glanced back at the building. Nope. No one racing out the door, no one leaping into a car after him. And though it seemed Todd had gotten away completely unnoticed, he didn't slow speeding down the road and distancing himself from Channel 10 as quickly and cleanly as possible. If he was correct in his assumption that it was the FBI who'd followed him to Rollins' apartment last night, he had every reason to believe they would tail him again now. As he drove along, he kept a steady eye on his mirrors. There was a blue van, a couple of sedans, a motorcycle. He couldn't discern if any of them was the vehicle from yesterday, however. Not on a busy two-lane road like this. Up ahead, he saw the gate of a fancy subdivision, and he purposely turned on his blinker. Breaking, he turned to the left and steered along a gently sloping street lined with what looked like expensive three-car garages with attached houses. He glanced back, but as far as he could tell, no one had turned after him. Just to make sure, he turned right at the next street, left at the one after that, then he slammed on the brakes and turned completely around. Speeding up, he retraced his route, but the subdivision was dead. The street was void of any life. Pedestrian and vehicular, as perplexed as much as he was, relieved, Todd slowed to a stop, and then just sat there, surprised by his good fortune. He turned around yet again and continued all the way through the winding streets of the subdivisions to the gate on the opposite side. He checked his mirrors once again, still could discern no one, and turned onto a busy road. It didn't make any sense, he thought, as he headed for the city, but he sure as hell wasn't going to argue. So how was he going to do this? How was he going to find Rollins? No, he couldn't do it by himself. That much he knew, just as he knew he couldn't tell the FBI and police what he suspected without endangering Rollins. Okay, okay. Think. He came to a convenience store, pulled in and went inside, bought a small bottle of cranberry juice with a fresh quarter in hand. He came out and went over to a payphone attached to the brick wall. Todd took a number from his wallet and dialed. A deep voice answered midway through the first ring. Hello? It's me. Todd Mills. I think I know where they are. Okay, here was the test question. 
Will you help me? Elio Cunningham audibly inhaled, then exhaled. Perhaps. It's very complicated, so I don't want the police involved or the FBI, at least not yet. After a hot story, are you? Hardly. Things have just turned a bit personal. So are you in or not? There was a long pause. Sure. Okay. Meet me at Lake and Hennepin. I'll be at the corner entrance to Calhoun Square. Todd glanced at his watch. Pick me up in 15 minutes. Todd hung up the receiver, opened the bottle of juice, and slammed it down. Then he hopped back in the Explorer and took off, afraid of what lay just ahead. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.